going to start the recording. This. We're doing this together, John. So I know, uh, I know. I'll let you start you it up, and I'll uh, I'll join when uh, when it's time to jump ask in the when you're ready for the poll. All right. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. We are now moving these online this semester. Um, as all of you are also moving all of your content online. Um, and these are for the remote support. So we are working with the um, Division of Continuing Studies um, and building off of their excellent webinars that they had that week that everybody was like, oh, what are we going to do? So joining forces across divisions, and that's uh, that was a good thing. Uh, these four topics that we've been doing, we are rotating. Uh, one is on improving the remote student experience. One is on assessment. One is on improving collaborations. And the fourth one is, uh, I forget what the fourth one is. Lecturing and alternatives. Lecturing alternatives, yeah, right. If you don't have a classroom full of faces, how do you do this? What works in the online experience? So. Um, today's topic, or today's theme, I guess, is improving the remote student experience. Every week we are going to refine what we talk about, so although the themes will be the same, um, what we talk about it depends on what you want to talk about and what we think you want to talk about based on what we heard last week. So we're starting to refine. This week we're thinking about how are we going to, we're looking forward to the next couple of weeks. How are we going to end the semester? How can we plan ahead? Um, on that. Um, so let's see, move to the next slide. Um, raise your hands, and that's that little icon on the bottom center. If you are familiar with Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, and we might be able to forego having to go through this part. All right, so there are a few of you that have not raised your hands, so we will have um, have a quick little tutorial on that. Karen Skibber, do you want to jump in on that? You're sure, I'd be happy part. to. I'd be happy to. So just for the few of you, and sorry about those who already know a lot about Blackboard Ultra, but the key thing here is, let me get my little pointer. You have a lot of nice tools you can use here in Blackboard Ultra. One here, I'm using the hand pointer tool here. So here you can use this little arrow, the, uh, the uh, uh, purple arrow to open and close the window, but I like to keep mine open, but it's up to you. So you can see chat going on and you can see the people that are in the room. So here's the chat where it looks like most of you are familiar with the chat. If not, just type in a little note in the little bubble here and say hello to everybody. Here's where you can see the participants and we're going to do a little poll today. So if you're if you click on the participants today when we do the poll, you'll be able to see how people voted. We'll do that a little bit later in the session here. And share, that's where I can share like uh, f the files that we're sharing right now. We can share polls, you can share applications. And settings is a good one if you didn't get a chance to put your photo in there yet. You can click on settings and your name and add your photo and things like that. I want to really encourage people to do that so we can associate a name with a face. Um, and it'll often, it kicked me out this morning. I had to re-enter mine, but I've just got a, a portrait on the um, on my desktop that I just keep jump adding in whenever I need to. Thank right, you. nowadays you have to always have a picture on your desktop. <laughs> That's for sure. And as we know, good tips to have are to make sure that when you use your microphone, make sure to turn it on. We've made that mistake a few times where we forget to turn on our audio. It's a very common mistake. Yes, we know, John. <laughs> but I've done it too, so I can't say anything. So honestly, that's sound is probably the biggest issue with Blackboard Collaborate. Once you get your sound working, actually most everything works pretty well. So make sure you turn off your microphone when you're not using it. Otherwise, we can hear all the background noise. And as John mentioned, to add your picture. And for those of you that have issues, often it's because you're not using Chrome. Chrome uh, somehow works really well with Blackboard Ultra and provides additional features that, that other um, 
browsers don't. Firefox does work as well, too, but I've found that working with Chrome is best. You, most of you joined using the guest link today, so hopefully you typed in your correct name and not Bucky Badger or something like that. Otherwise, we won't know who you are. So uh, that when you do a guest link that uh, everyone can type in what they would like. Uh, but if you join through the course room, it automatically knows who you are. So those so are one, one more thing on this. Maybe. This is really important for um, classroom cohesiveness, and so that your students start to know each other. So first names alone are great after the end of the semester. Um, I know who, Sarah, who Hazel is, but I'm not sure which of the Sarahs um, the Sarah is. So eh, I know several Sarahs, but. Um, it, this helps me sort of say, oh, do I know that person? How do I know that person? And it reinforces um, those memories in my brain, which helps me engage more honestly and openly. And we'll show Very a couple of the yeah, and we'll show a couple of the tools today. I think a lot of you have done these. And here, um, this is where you can add that picture also. There's always two ways to do things. And this is another way where you can just click on this silhouette person. And this is also where you would share your video. I can say hello from Germantown, Wisconsin. Hello, everybody. So I'm over here in kind of a cloudy day over here in Germantown. So that's where you would share your video. And all of you obviously knew how to raise your hand. So those are the key things. We're going to try out these annotation tools in a minute. And we'll also try out the polling tool today. So let's go. And I'll let John explain the format of the labs. Well, oh, John, again, you forgot the, the I mistake. I did it again. On your right. <laughs> As a moderator, I think it's better to just leave it on all the time. So with our regular face-to-face -face labs, what we often do is we go around and we say, who are, who is everybody, and what are the questions that they want to do? Um, it's a little bit different in a, a virtual environment right now. Um, we can see the names of the participants and their faces, and, and that helps us sort of recognize who people are already. Um, and we will start off now with sort of a review of the top tips that we've had so far. Um, and this is in case you only have a few minutes and need to jump out of today's session, um, at least you'll have something that we can talk about. It also gets us all uh, thinking about what are some of the questions that we want to talk about within this theme. So that'll be the first part of the, the five top tips. Um, then we're going to go on and actually solicit what are the needs that you have to talk about and we will direct you to the activity sheet um, that I've put in chat. I'm going to put it back in chat again for that person who just I saw popped in the room. Um, and you can go to that and we'll share that activity sheet. It's a collaborative Google document uh, that you can just go on and type into on the second section of uh, the what do you want to learn frequently asked questions part. Then we go around and we address the questions. And as soon as you start typing it in, often we will have our moderators jump in and give you answers. And some of these answers are fantastic answers, and some of them are good answers. Um, and we can discuss those in more detail as we, um, as we continue. And what we'll try to do is we'll try to map out a route from sort of the most, um, well, either the first answers that we can come up with or the sort of the, the, the most pressing answers that we have. At that point, um, we'll point you down farther on the activity sheet to other resources that we have. Hopefully, you will also have resources and examples that you can share out with us, and that would be awesome. And then um, at 11 o'clock, we usually end up the session, or at least the formal part of the session, and leave it open for questions that we haven't quite addressed, or maybe more advanced questions that aren't necessarily uh, fit in with everybody, but might be more specialized to your specific cases, OK? But first of all, we want to hear from you. See, John, I turned on my microphone. <laughs> We would like you to use the annotation tool. So now we're considering the semester is winding down. So last time we kind of gave some tips overall, but now we would like to know what are your concerns about the remote student experience now that we really only have a few more weeks to the semester. So if you could click on, you can see here this little T tool. If you could type in what are your concerns now that the semester is winding down regarding the remote student experience. So I'll give you a few minutes to type in your thoughts. 
And then I always use my pointer tool here so I can see and I like to, we're already thinking of next semester, my goodness. So <laughs> already preparing. So the problem is you're, you're winding down this semester and preparing for next semester. And we have a lot of um, faculty who are also teaching this summer. So they're winding down this course and already preparing for summer. So that's a good one. Any others? Feeling isolated when they're accustomed to working in teams in the lab. Good. Uh, what works best for my students? Connecting with students at the end of the semester. You came to the right place. We'll talk about those items. Um, what works best for my students? You, I already said that one. I'm trying to make this one bigger, but I'm having trouble dragging. Here it is. Uh, what is appropriate workload for a full um, in a full-time online course? Okay. And in fact, there's a tip sheet on the instructional resources website right now that provides some good guidelines on that workload issue talking about credit hours and how to figure out, you know, maybe how much time that you have your students working on something. So if somebody could share that instructional resources uh, website where the tip sheets are, uh, and we can talk about that. Uh, meaningful wrap up. I really like to hear that because when I talk to a lot of faculty, they forget a course has to have a great beginning, right? Obviously you have the middle the during where you have all the activities, but a lot of times people forget about the end. In a classroom, you kind of have a natural ending where people get a chance to, to say goodbye and, uh, you know, to their peers that they've been working with all semester. I also recommend that in a remote course, in an online course, to make sure you have a place to say goodbye, maybe a, a lessons learned area or just a place where they could say goodbye. Even in a Blackboard Collaborate session like this, you can wave goodbye or you could uh, say goodbye or use your microphone. So I think it's always important to have a nice beginning, middle, and an ending. So I'm really glad somebody wrote in there a meaningful way to wrap up. Um, anything else? And this one is similar to, to that, connecting with the students at the end of the semester. So you guys are way ahead of the game already. So I don't know if somebody wants to take a picture of that, and then we can move on. That's one of the negatives about using the whiteboard. It goes away once I hit this arrow, but it is in the recording. Uh, the recording will take this, but it will not record the poll that I'm about to do, and it doesn't record the videos, which is fine with me. But <laughs> but it is. that's one of the things people like to use this tool for a lecture, but if it doesn't record your video, you do lose that capability. So thank you for sharing what your concerns are. I think we should be able to talk about each of those. So what I would like to do, I'm going to, I already set up a poll. Um, I'm going to share a poll. You can do this on the fly. Oops. Um, and can you guys see the poll now? Okay, so which question do you, of course it covers the question, which I always hate. So now I can't move that. Uh, so which question do you want to talk about? What will you do for the final project? Now I've got to go look and see because I can't see what the questions are. So A is what student feedback do you need about exams, final projects, personal concerns, issues? B, how will you gather that feedback? C, what options will be provided to students who may be facing barriers such as internet, personal concerns, other? D, what needs to be communicated to explain what will take place in the next few weeks? And E, what resources will you provide students to help them successfully complete your course? So if you could choose A, B, C, or D. Um, so you can vote on that and then I'll show the responses. Yes, Sarah? Did you lose the, is it showing or not? Sarah? Can you use your microphone? Uh, sorry, I'm new to this. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to select which question, and some of these also seem like they build on each other, so I'm not sure how you, can you pick for more than one? Yes. Yes, you can pick more than one. If you prefer, instead of using the polling tool, it does cover the answer. We will talk about all of these. You can just select on the answer that you would like to, to do. Okay. Not able to any either. It won't let you select it. Let me start it over again. Yeah. I was trying to get that to be smart and set that up in advance. 
but it didn't like to keep it. So, well, oh well. Okay, so let's do A, B. That's one of the things with the poll. I tried to do it in advance and it didn't like that. So take a look, pick which one you would like because the poll, as you will see, will cover it in a minute. And then, all right, I'm going to hit start now. All right, now you should be able to see it. Yep. I guess you can't prepare it in advance, no matter how well I thought I could do that in advance. That's the one negative about Blackboard Collaborate. Some things you simply cannot prepare in advance. You have to do on the fly. And we can talk about all of these. I just want to get the conversation started. We have eight more people who haven't responded. Okay, seven, six. Those might be our facilitators. Anyone else want to vote before I show the responses? Okay, so we got a tie and very, it's all very close. It sounds like you want to talk about all of them, but it sounds like A and D are top and then we can talk about the rest as well. So A and D, what student feedback do you need about exams, final projects, personal concerns and issues? and what needs to be communicated to explain what will take place in the few weeks. So as we start talking about those, John, did you post the active teaching lab sheet? I have been, yes. Okay, great. So why don't you explain that and then we'll start the conversation while they're typing in the active teaching lab sheet. All right, so let me just jump into my sharing application and screen. I, I've learned to share this, the Chrome tab rather than the screen because that gives me a better opportunity um, to make it larger. And then I can just click on zoom it up so that I can make it the right size for you all. Can I do 200? 200 might be too much. There it is. All right, so the, acti the activity sheet, you can see we've got it here, and that's the one that I put into the chat. And we've got the top five tips we started talking about a little bit, um, but we haven't talked too much about those yet, we will. And then the next section, you can see the what do you want to learn. And I just got another notice from Blackboard Collaborate saying that I'm having trouble, but I presume that I'm not having trouble, so. Um, in the do you want to learn part, go ahead and grab a number and type it in. And as soon as we come up with answers, we will type our answers down below, but we can also start talking about them. And I see that somebody's got a plus two here. Andrea just added for number five. If you do that, add a plus at the very beginning, because that'll make it easier for us to, um, you can see what I just typed in here. There you go. Andrea, I put it in there for you. But if you add a plus at the beginning, we can scan through and we can see it right away. So if somebody wants to, um, somebody else wants to talk about number one, just add a plus beforehand. And if multiple people want to do it, add two pluses. So, so while we're here, let's see, should we just jump into these or do you want to, Karen, should we talk more about the five tips that we talked about already. Last well, let's let's quick talk about the one that's down below there because it was one that was voted on. If you can scroll back to the one and then we'll go to the top tips. Uh, okay. But it was mentioned here about how do you de debrief about how the semester went. Um, so a lot of people were asking how are you going to wrap up this course? And I think that's a great one to start thinking about right now because you may want to start planning for how you're going to wrap up your course. And I want to open this up uh, uh, to everyone on their ideas, but it just so happens that this is something that we cover quite heavily in one of our courses, facilitation and management and teach online. And it's really important to wrap up a course well and debrief. Um, and make sure that students feel like they can have an ending to their course and that they have an ending to their learning as well, that they can wrap it up. So this is a wonderful opportunity to have a potentially a lessons learned discussion. We do that in each of our courses or what are, from all the things that you've learned from this course, you can either do that via Blackboard Ultra like we're doing right now, or you could, you could even have them post on the whiteboard if you want, or you could do it, we often do it in the discussion forum uh, because we have people who like to 
say long things, which I love to read. So they get to post in the discussion forum the things that they've learned, and then they can bounce ideas off each other. Oh, yeah, I learned that too. And it's a great way to, to wrap up the course, as well as getting feedback from your students. But I know there's a lot of uh, different issues, and I don't know what's going to be happening with course evaluations, but it doesn't mean that you can't ask students, you know, how, how you know, in a mini survey, you know, now that this was a remote course, you could ask a few minor questions in the survey tool as well, but I know there's different rules about that, so I have to be careful what I say, but I don't think it's an issue to ask just a couple questions on, on, on what students thought about um, the course, but also the learning. Uh, is there a way that you can kind of have students bring together all the different things that they've learned in the course? I want to open this up for other people's ideas because this is a, a collaborative thing. So what are what are some ideas from all of you? What have you done? Uh, think about maybe what you've done in your face-to-face -face course and how can you do that here? So what are ideas from from all of you guys on how you wrap up your course? How do you do it face-to-face, -face, for example? Margaret. Uh, yeah, there's a number of activities that I think can be very effective in really summarizing the learning outcomes, but also to provide evidence of performance and evaluation. And um, one of the ways that I could do this in my course would be to do some self reflection activities. But uh, whether we're in a classroom or if we're in an online uh, environment, we can still work in groups, right? So we could still ask them to group together or arrange those groupings. And we could do a virtual round table sharing. We could ask very uh, good questions like, what was, what was your most favorite activity throughout the term? Or what, what was the most compelling thing you learned? Or, uh, you know, these sort of questions where you're getting them to tick and tie, you're getting them to, to start from, hey, what was the learning objective to how did I do in this course, but then also to connect it in emerging activities such as how will I apply this in the field of practice and how will I assess myself in the field of practice? You know, in the classroom, we have this very guided, you know, obviously curriculum, but once we get out there in the real world, we have to self-assess and we have to ask ourselves, am I meeting the goals that I set for myself? And so it's, it's kind of nice if you can somehow take a reflection or take a group work and get them to actually commit to making changes uh, in their practice and in, in their self-assessment in the future. So that's just a few thoughts. No, those are great thoughts. And I like how you brought it back to the whole uh, your course objectives. So bringing it back to what they were going to learn from the very beginning and how have they learned that, what worked best, what was their key lessons learned? You know, what was what worked best for them? That's a great ending to a course. That's that's wonderful. Anybody else have some ideas they'd like yeah, to share? Even getting them. Go ahead. We lost you. Okay, it's Margaret again. I didn't know if I was talking over someone. Um, if I did, I apologize. I was going to say the the real the real takeaway from that uh, closure or you know activity is that they can actually make a statement of commitment and and again that's kind of a reflection but if they want to share it they could and it's you know it's basically I commit to um, whatever you know establishing these goals for myself in my career and I commit to making changes uh, that will have a meaningful impact based on readings or key activities or hey hey every agree to follow up and coffee um, even if it's virtual, right? <laughs> virtual uh, tea, and and talk about was this effective? So you could even give them a template or a rubric that they could even design a rubric for themselves. In other words, yeah, okay, well we did the class now. What? How will you take this to the next level? And get them to write down those goals and those commitments. When people write things down and post it somewhere or virtually write it down and put it on their desktop where they see it every day, they're more likely to integrate those changes and more likely to share their successes. Great, thank you, great ideas. 
let me just jump in there before um, Megan joins us because I, I know that she's got something to say as well. Um, and and say the, one of the things that this Margaret you reminded me of was the instructor who said, um, we know that time management is a big thing for students, and it might be a huge thing for students in a remote environment where their their strategy, their their routine of the face-to-face -face hard structured week um, is thrown off as we have more and more things brought into the asynchronous remote space. So one of the instructors said, all right, at the beginning of the semester, and this was with face-to-face, -face, I want you to tell me when you're going to be working in the class. Show me your calendar spot. So when Margaret, you talked about having them write it down, having them sort of even mentally make that thought, I'm going to work on this from Mondays from 2 to 3 or 2 to 4 is when I'm going to do this, or Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from whenever to whenever is when I'm working on the class. If you can get them to think about that, that's a great way to sort of keep them involved in that. Sorry, Megan, for jumping in. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I was thinking just going off uh, what Margaret said about what students thought were best in the course, or how um, things worked for them. I was thinking it might be worth asking students to compare and contrast the um, online versus the in-person um, events in the course because if you know I know a lot of people are going to want to go straight back to in person and I certainly do um, but <laughs> I think you know, we're, we, we're learning new stuff and it's worth finding out from the students what they thought maybe worked a little bit better that we can add into our courses in the future um, to improve the courses. And we don't even have to wait for the future right it's only April. Right, we still have a couple of weeks left that we can make changes immediately. I mean, we don't have a lot of time left over, but it's it's there's still time, and this is new territory. So asking the students what works and what doesn't work is great. Ask them what's working in their other courses because you can learn from their uh, their other instructors that you might not be able to have conversations with directly. Go ahead, Juan. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, just uh, piggybacking backing on, on, on that comment. Uh, we we are just approaching the third week, the midpoint of this transformation. <laughs> it's six weeks uh, of of this mini online modality. So I was planning on doing something on the third week, kind of checking a big big check in with with everybody. And then regarding the <clears throat> the big finale. Uh, in my, it's very conventional, but in my, my big lecture class, what I do is, I mean, the last lecture together with the first one is, is key. And there is, the, I, I plan to do another narrated presentation in which I do what I do in that last lecture. That is, not only make them reflect on, on, on what they have done, but just helping them a little bit because sometimes they don't really realize what has happened during the semester. And in my case, I, I tell them, look, you've been listening to a native for 50 minutes, 100 minutes a, a week, and you have been covering all this material and you are really uh, kind of a, a, in a second second culture immersion right here. So I mean, uh, helping them realizing, even just going back to the syllabus sometimes and saying, you, you, you know what we were trying to accomplish? Well, this is it. And, and, and we have done it. So it's some kind of a, Again, uh, not only that they reflect on what they have done, but, but it help them a little bit just realize what we have accomplished. That's a great That's point. All. Thank, you. Well, thank you very much for sharing. We appreciate that. So why don't we pop up to the key takeaways once? I mean, I mean the top tips, I'm still going to call that. Can you pop up there a minute? Um, yeah. let's see if there's one that has to deal with uh, a lot of you were asking about also in the in the uh, annotation activity how you're going to start getting them prepared for what's coming at the end and maybe you're still planning what's going to be coming at the end so I, that's what I was going with number one here about the communicating what's going to be taking place because I'm sure your students have a lot of anxiety of what's going to happen how they're going to finish the finish their exams how they're going to finish their final projects and even though we have a few weeks out yet this is a good time to start 
having those conversations because I'm sure they're anxious. They have to do this for all of their courses. So this is a good time to start to, if you don't have it planned out now, this is a great time to have a plan for how you're going to wrap up all of those final, especially the major projects, right, and clearly communicate what that is going to be. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions on that point? Because that was brought up also on the importance of wrapping up, getting the course ready for um, finals, getting the course ready for final projects, getting things wrapped up. Anyone want to provide either ideas, thoughts, or questions on that? And this might be a good time to ask your students on the number five there on what are their concerns about wrapping up the course and what are some issues that they might encounter on finalizing the course. And I think there's a, a tip sheet on gathering feedback from your students as well that provides some very easy ways to do that. That's on the Instructional Resources website too because they didn't sign up for this type of course. So maybe it now is a good time with a few weeks out to find out if there's going to be any issues with some of the things that you are planning to do to wrap up the course. Has anybody tried to do this with their students? Anybody? Anyone thinking of doing this for their students? We've got a quiet group here. <laughs> Anyone feel free. This is an active teaching lab. Yes, Juan? <laughs> Uh, yes. Well, what I said before, I mean, now at the end of this week, uh, a survey is going to go out to, to them uh, asking about possible concerns and also asking specifically about uh, the usefulness of all the components. I mean, what do you think of the narrator presentations, the mastery checks, uh, the thinking questions, the videos? I mean, there, there will be a kind of scale of one to five and, and, and to check what was, what was useful. Uh, for them and then it's, it's going to be now because we are midpoint uh, through the six last weeks of, of the semester. And this is John. I'm going to jump in here as well and, and say that you, you don't even have to wait for that um, in a specific survey. Build it into a, a quiz question or an assignment. Um, say, you know, write your paper or whatever your assignment is, but also include in a section what are your thoughts on this assignment? How can it be done? How did you enjoy doing it? What, how did you go about doing it? What could be done better? What, in what ways can you, um, what ways could I have had you better reflect on or connect to the, the content given the situation that we're doing in a remote um, teaching, remote instruction situation? Um, by asking them, you're doing two things. You're getting feedback from them so that'll inform your planning for next semester or for the summer. Um, whether it's face-to-face -face in next semester or next spring or not, getting that feedback will be useful for you. It also gets them to reflect on what they just learned, on what were the important parts or what did they think were the important parts, what did they think were not important. Um, and that helps you redesign your assignment as well. So are, you can see, are they getting the thought are they getting the content and the major ideas um, that I wanted them to get? So asking them to share their reflections on that requires reflecting on it. And oftentimes, I think our students, speaking for myself at least, um, I'll do the assignments and I won't think about why I'm doing it or what, I, what the purpose of it is or if there were better ways of doing that. So if you can get that out of your students, even in the assignments themselves, that'll help you in the future and it helps them. It also gives them a chance to communicate with you and the other students, which will be building more presence in the course because they can feel probably starting to feel even more isolating as they're, they've they been doing this now longer remotely. So it gives them an opportunity to communicate with each other, share ideas with you and others. So that's, that's a good one as well. So which other question should we tackle next, John? Oh, I'm the, the reflection activities, I guess the number one actually just builds on that as well. Um, and then, yeah, connecting with Bloom's taxonomy, you can, or the, the Bloom's cognitive taxonomy. Um, 
is, is a great way to, to think about how they're thinking about it, but also you can use their um, Bloom's Affective Taxonomy to see whether they are starting to value um, what they're learning as well. So not just do they understand it, but are they starting to see the world from the disciplinary uh, lens that we want them to? Um, so that might be another way to do that as well. And then I guess uh, number eight is the next one. And Karen, you are much more of a Blackbird Collaborate master than I am. Well, I don't know about that, but it, it, what was the question? How to do groups that went away? So I have to see it. Yeah, sorry. I, it's, Blackboard is again telling me that my connection isn't good enough. So huh. if you can still hear me, it's how have instructors made small groups in Blackboard? What are instructors asking students to do to increase collegiality, especially if this is the first time the students have never have ever met before, thinking ahead to the summer session for this? So yeah, how do you build class collegiality when they haven't had face-to-face -face classes to do that beforehand? And I'm going to step out and reload. OK. Well, it's very easy to create groups in Blackboard. Um, I don't know if I should show my computer here because I'll get that weird screen here, but I'll do it. So just excuse here why I share. Sometimes when you share your entire screen, you get this weird effect. So excuse about the effect here. Uh, so you're now seeing, whoops, I'm sharing the wrong thing. I'm sharing his, uh, I wanted to share the entire screen. Share. Sorry, I, I jumped. I can't seem to do it. There it goes. So now we're getting that horrible effect here where you can see everything. But you can see now exactly what's going on in this room at the same time that I do it. So when I do things here, you can see. But it's very easy to do the breakout groups. It's just right here. But it's one of those things, again, that you have to do on the fly in Blackboard. And you can have different groups, like you can have groups of two. I can have up to five. It, it chooses how many groups you can have based on how many are in the room. Uh, you can include the moderators in the group. So if I check this, we'll all, be, all, all would be mixed up with you there. You can randomly assign or you can custom assign where you could allow the students to actually go from one room to another. I won't do it because it will be uh, you know, frustrating for you to, to go to a group right now. But you, I can drag people from one group to another. Um, so you can see that I can change that. And then once I hit start, it would go. But one thing I highly recommend is whatever, have something prepared for them to talk about. So if you're going to do this as an ending activity, you might have a good question or several questions you want them to discuss. The problem is if you post that that question in Blackboard Ultra here, once you go into the group, that goes away. So you have to, you can share uh, files with the group. Um, there is a way that once you're in a group, if I hit start here, and I can't uh, do that right now, but if I go to, if I would hit start and, and, and I wanted to share a file, I would be able to share a file with a group. I would be able to, there would be another thing here that says share with the group. It won't do that right now because you're not in a group. So the second that you're in a group, I could share a file. Or you could also type to everyone a question, or maybe you have a list of questions. You could type that here, and that would go to everybody in the group. Or you could have a Google Doc, which is like what you're, we're doing today, which is what we recommend, um, is to have a Google Doc like we're doing with questions that they could discuss. And then all you would need to do is share that Google Doc here. Karen, did you want to make a comment about the, the groups? That you had a good tip in there. If you number your groups in Canvas, then you could have students just select the number or breakout room, and you could allow them to change their groups, right? Because I have several people, who, instructors, who say I have groups in Canvas, you know, and I want them to have the same group in Blackboard Ultra. So you might have to call it Group One. You could give them a name in Canvas, but here it could be Group One, and then they could select to go to Group One, so they would stay in the same group. I like to use the Google Doc, just like we're doing today, because then you don't have to worry about that sharing of the files or whatever, and then they can have a, a nice discussion. So does that answer the group question before I get out of the groups? Does that answer that? Good. So John, you want to share your Active Teaching Lab sheet? And what was the other question? I'll go to the sheet. So that's how you do groups. It's pretty easy to do. Um, well, what should, so what's I'm going to jump in with a, with a um, 
we had talked a little bit about sharing out a, a document for them to um, work on, and I wanted to share from a previous activity sheet um, on embedding iframes in Google Docs. I wanted to share out this last piece right here, and it's a cool trick that lets you, there it is, take the URL that's at the top of the, the Google Doc, right? So on the top of my page here, you can see that I highlight, well, you can't see it because it's not in there, but in the, the, the URL bar, you get this document here, right? And, and here's the one that it would be for a regular Google Doc. And what I do is I take out the slash edit at the end here, and I replace it with slash copy. And that way, whenever anybody opens up a, a, or whenever anybody clicks on that, and that can just be shared as a URL, I'll put it in the chat here, you can see that um, by clicking on it, you're asked, do I, do I wanna make a copy of it? So you can have the students um, actually have their own copies for them to answer and work on in their small breakout groups. So it's a good way to sort of get them working together on, on those things. I used that trick and I had like 100 copies. <laughs> I kept hitting copy. So you have to make sure you instruct the students to say, now look in your drive and that's what we're we'll doing. Right. Or you'll be like me and have uh, multiple copies. <laughs> I kept clicking. <laughs> Jeffrey. For that trick, if they do, I guess, type on that document and then want to send it back to you, would it, yep. how would that be sent that back it, without it, worked, it being a copy URL? It works great because what once they copy it, it, it no longer says slash copy. They will get one that says slash edit. So their uh, own version will have a slash edit on it, and then they can just upload it into... Um, your Canvas course as an assignment, or as a URL, oh, cool. and okay. Canvas will take that snapshot of that document that they worked on and treat it as a, a, as a regular Google document. And John, I don't see this question on the Active Teaching Lab sheet, but it was voted on as one to talk about. Um, so what options are you going to provide your, to your students who might be facing barriers have have any of you on the line here run into issues with students who are having difficulties participating in the road environment anybody raise your hand anybody anybody running into issues where you're losing students and they just don't have uh, the capability to participate like you would like them to anybody and you're talking about um, because they're they, they just keep having technical issues it could be any reason. It could be technical issues. It could be because they're having illnesses or, you know, that they can't participate, that they have children that they're taking care of and they can't participate. It could be a whole slew of issues that we, you know, there's so many right now going on. Have you run into any issues with, with students not being able to participate in your course in this new environment? Anyone? I've been having a problem. Go ahead, no. Margaret. I have. Okay, Margaret here. Well, I, I've certainly seen this in many uh, examples. You've given some good examples, but I think one of the most obvious is that it simply is not their preferred learning style for many students. And of course, depending on the major that they have selected, they, they may not be very good with communicating through just typing. And uh, they may be more social learners. They may be hands-on experiential learners. We know from the science of learning uh, style that some students certainly are successful when they can demonstrate their performance and competency in their preferred learning style. You know, even in elementary, secondary schools, students do lean towards maybe students prefer shop class or uh, hands-on mechanical type things. And if you were to take someone from, let's just say, automotive shop program and tell them, well, now you're going to learn all this online, I, I think they're going to give up. I think they're going to say, I don't, I, I can't do this. I just can't do this cognitively, don't know how to contribute. It's hard for me to dive into that online discussion. I just don't, I, they don't understand the cues. You know, we have these dialogue cues. We all talk. We, we've even seen some of this on these calls. We talk over the top of each other because we can't see each other and know that someone else is gesturing about to speak. 
So I just think some of the logistical um, components of the online environment actually uh, is an impediment to some students who express themselves in their learning in a different style. Have you experienced that? Or just you're thinking certainly, that? No, I've certainly seen that uh, over the years. And, you know, sometimes you have to actually uh, set up maybe an alternative assessment process uh, for that individual even go so far as to say, hey, let's come up with an uh, individual educational program, IEP, which of course is so common in public K-12, but it certainly is available to any learner who is struggling with um, instructional design, particularly in an online environment. Well, yeah, we hear about I, a lot in online education, but sometimes online education can actually be more active because you can provide them more opportunities to be more active. And it, when it comes to learning, it's, it's a great idea for them to learn in many different ways, even beyond what they feel comfortable with. So it's a good opportunity for th to them to learn because in the real world, they'll have to learn just the way that we're doing here today. They'll, they'll need to use web conferencing. They'll need to use online education. So sometimes it's good to go beyond their comfort zone and they can learn new skills and capabilities and offer a variety of ways for people to learn. I think that's one of our tips on top there is to give a mixture of asynchronous and synchronous. Give them, give them things to do that is active and the wonderful things that you guys talked about a minute ago on how to wrap up the course is very active. So sometimes online learning can be more active than face-to-face -face because you're not just listening, and I know that's not what you guys do in your course, you have activities, but you always can have them do things that are interactive and get them involved, get them to use the different experiences. So it, it can be a growth opportunity for students as well. So John, did you want to add anything? I, I'll, I'll just say that, that you, as Sarah Mason said, Sarah, uh, Margaret, you've got great points there. Um, it's very uncomfortable to move, it is for me, to move to this online space as well. It's a definitely a stretch challenge, right, a stretch goal. Um, and it can be um, frustrating at times. I keep getting kicked out of Blackboard Collaborate, and I swear if I get kicked out one more time in this session, I'm not coming back. Um, I will, but it feels that way. And I think that this is... Um, to, to Karen Skibba's point, the more opportunities or the more ways that you can, uh, one, keep connecting with them, keep reassuring them, keep sort of guiding them through that growth and that sort of shift. Uh, we all need help, I think, to change from one medium to another medium. And the first time that we're learning to get familiar and comfortable with something else, it's, it's hard and having that social support from our instructors, from our friends, from our learning cohort, et cetera. That helps us get through that sort of the grind of, oh my gosh, you kicked me out again. I can't do this, this isn't worth it. Um, also to Karen Skibba's point, multiple ways. If you can um, supplement the only text only thing uh, discussions with add some photos, add some videos, add some GIFs, um, maybe have a few async or synchronous sessions so that if you really feel like you just need to talk to somebody, you can do that. Let your students in the small groups um, to the question number eight there for collegiality, give them a space in Canvas so that they can start their own Blackboard Collaborate sessions in their small groups so that just the five of them or four of them or however three of them can get together and say, this sucks, how do I do this? How have you figured out how to do this? Um, if you give them those opportunities, some of them will take them up, I think. Yes, and in fact, we're writing a, am I on? <laughs> we're doing a tip sheet on this right now that will be shared on the instructional continuity website because the best thing you can do for these students is communications, frequent, personalized, when somebody's falling off, the best thing that you can possibly do is send them a note, I see that you're not participating, 
what's going on, you know, are you okay? Instead of just assuming that they've that this isn't uh, working for them, they might be having personal issues, they might be having technology issues. Um, come up, give them, and you can do that very easily. I do that all the time in Speed Grader, where I see people haven't participated in a discussion. I go into Speed Grader and I can send a note to everybody who hasn't participated and say, hey, I'm, I'm worried about you, I haven't seen you. What's going on? All my people here from Teach Online know that I did that quite a bit and I'm worried about you, and that has the biggest impact on students. It shows that you care, you can help and reach out to them. So in addition to multiple means of engagement, have multiple means of communications. Um, and the best communications is a personal note or email to a student who's falling behind to see what you can do to help them. But it is, it is a, it's a difficult situation for a lot of students and, and the, you know, it's beyond the technology, it's beyond being online, it's, it's health issues and family issues and so many things going on right now that we can't even imagine what's going on in their lives. So being, being you know, the, and that was another one on the recent tip sheet is to really to be compassionate about the situation that they're in right now. It's a tough situation, not just for, it's difficult for us too, it's also difficult for the students, but that's a very good point. Has anyone found a way that has helped when you're reaching out to your students to help them overcome some of these issues? Has anybody had a technique that's worked for them? And again, this is why we do the Active Teaching Labs, because we do not have all of the answers, and there are, there are solutions out there that people have, um, that maybe you have uh, and have tried, that, that will help us figure this out or give us other ways to try these things. Juan? Uh, yes, uh, it's a variation of what Karen said. I mean, I, I've been going to grade a lot and just checking who who was late with assignments and directly email, email, them, email them and, and tell them, hey, uh, you didn't do this. I'm assuming there is technical difficulties. I'll open it. I, I open it up for you again. So directly kind of being very, very flexible and, and just opening opening assignments when 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 people have haven't met them. I'm I'm also doing I mean deadlines for my tasks and assignments are everywhere because I think that they are they are missing they they email me back saying oh I, I didn't realize that it was due and again they have four sometimes six classes online so my assign my deadlines uh, and due dates are in of course in the assignments th themselves but also in the, in the titles of the modules in the content i mean ev in the weekly rhythm i mean there is no way i mean they can miss them or i'm trying to help them not to miss any single uh, due date because i i, lo I know it's a lot of, 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 of things to handle for them right now yeah, Thank that's you. the our number one top five tip here is communicate clearly and frequently and then to check that clarity. So make sure um, we've tried at the beginning of our, our course design and we had this session back in January. People talked about having on the syllabus, having um, syllabus exams or sil syllabus scavenger hunts. What are they called? They're something like that. Well, anyway, they, they say, hey, students, take a quiz on the syllabus and that way if the students pass the quiz then they get their content unlocked so they can say later on now you know where to see our, the assignments where to find the due dates so it, it's a way to sort of check that clarity with the students sarah mason can you talk a little bit more can you turn on your mic and 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 um take that chat thought and bring it on to the synchronous space here? Uh, sure. Um, so, uh, so my background is um, I work with uh, active learning courses in the WISA classrooms. And a lot of what I'm seeing uh, in this discussion thread is the the challenge of taking um, what is important about a face-to-face -face class in terms of the relationships between instructors and students, students and students, um, uh, and just saying things like communication is to me kind of uh, uh, generic in that 
uh, for a lot of instructors, communications, I think, is seen as being either verbal um, through audio or written. And I think part of what the challenge of going online is to create that more kind of human element where um, you create a personal connection with your students online and you help develop or keep those relationships that students had with each other earlier on in the semester. And also you have to think about how to connect with your, uh, your students as a group when you're uh, doing your uh, online course, but also in these um, opportunities for students to connect with you in office hours and all those kinds of things. And I basically just wanted to confirm what I was hearing from John and Karen and, and also in these tips is that um, uh, going deep into what we mean by communication and what we mean by supporting your students and recognizing their needs is that it's a kind of a two-way street and it also has to go a little bit deeper into these really personal aspects of uh, what is inherent in what we have in a place-based classroom but is much more challenging to create online. And so part of this was me just validating the conversation, but also kind of thinking about it more deeply in terms of how can we help instructors go to that deeper place. Um, obviously, in the rest of the semester, it's going to be a challenge because of the time crunch. But going long term over the summer, or future online courses, and then figuring out what can we learn from face-to-face uh, -face classes that we can apply to online, but then also what are we learning in these new online experiences that we can then bring back to face-to-face -face classrooms? Yeah, this reminds me of one of the biggest insights that I got from the Teach Online at UW course that I took when Karen was, I don't know if it was your second year on that, um, Karen Skeba, but in a face-to-face -face course, we might look out on our sea of students and get a couple of questions, and somebody will ask a question, um, or somebody will give some feedback, and we'll be able to give that feedback to the whole class. And oftentimes in an online space, um, we've got 20 different people, we've got to give that feedback 20 different times in 20 different ways. So what are the ways that we can, it's much harder, to have that personal connection, to have the students feel like they're connected both with each other. In the classroom, they feel that because they are sitting next to each other, right? But online, they're, they're sitting far away from each other. Um, so it's a bigger challenge. Part of the way that we can handle that, that I learned, is by figuring out ways to get them to support each other, because we cannot. It's just hard for us to make as tight connections. It's not that it's hard. It's a lot of work to make those really tight connections with individual students. So if we can, in an online space, get them to also support each other so that they don't just feel like it's a class between me and the instructor, but they also feel like there are other people in the class with me. Um, yeah, ways of doing that, you know, it's, it's hard right now. So bring on, bring everybody who's still around and the participants bring on your, your, your tips and ideas and such. Theo, you brought a really good point. They use these static assigned textbooks and for that you're not even making a connection between you and the instructor. It's between uh, uh, between the you and the student. It's just between the student and the, the textbook. And so that learning is very sort of one person to one authoritative text, right? And that's very traditional education, but it's changing and technology lets us um, have that changing. And in many ways, classrooms are great equalizers in many ways. I know that we, that's a, a point that can be discussed forever. But people come in, they all sit in the same desk, they all have the same access to Wi-Fi, you know, they might have different computers, but they all have the same textbooks, they all have the same tests. All of that is sort of this great equalizer. Now in the remote situation, they're going back to their own houses or apartments, um, cars, they are not in that same space. Some of them are parking in the library uh, parking lot to use the Wi-Fi of the library, while others have these great sunlit um, 
spaces and the you know that they they have great Wi-Fi and the the disparities and inequalities are 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 much different outside of the classroom. Um, so figuring out different ways of connecting them um, so that some of those resources are I don't know shared or I, I guess I'm not sure exactly. Um, I can say more. I can babble on. I'm starting to babble. Somebody jump in. Share your ideas. Karen Krabenhoff, you teach, do you teach online still or? Oh, we actually do a mixture of things. We've got a lot of online resources for our anatomy courses, um, as prep work, that sort of thing for our live sessions. I think I'm struggling because we've got anatomy labs where students normally dissect and uh -huh. they're eliminated both for this semester and we learned early this week for the summer as well. Um, that was possibly going to be an exception to the chancellor's order, but um, we know now for sure we've got to go 100% online with our professional students this summer and try and somehow recreate an anatomy lab experience for them. So we've been uh, shopping around, looking at different options, trying to figure out how we're going to do that. So uh, we have up till this point used a lot of um, blended learning with a lot of prep work, online resources, but now we'll be going 100% online this summer for both our physician assistant and our physical therapy students. Okay. And from our lab yesterday, maybe Karen Spader, maybe you can post that too from our lab yesterday. Um, there's amazing amounts of virtual labs. I wouldn't be surprised if anatomy was one of them. In fact, there's a spreadsheet that the UW system put out that keeps growing and growing, and I keep getting emails day after day about new virtual labs that are popping up, and uh, you might be surprised that maybe some of these labs are virtual now. So we have that in our other tip sheet from yesterday, a whole bunch of virtual labs. I don't know, Karen, mm -hmm. are you able to find that? Um, uh, yeah, because, so we'll see. There are some virtual labs, especially anatomy, I think, is one of them, biology, mm -hmm. maybe. So you might be fortunate and find some of that. Uh, but there is a list of those. And uh, it's in one of our tip sheets from, from yesterday to find that. Excellent. Yes. We'll definitely yes. back to that. And you know, there are various online labs available and we've kind of browsed around a little bit but haven't really found anything that we love at this point but uh, that's probably or possibly not realistic to find something that you know is going to be the perfect fit for what we need. We're going to just adapt the best we can and try and convey that sort of information to the best of our ability through photos and videos that we already have in hand to try and uh, get the students that foundation that they need. Would it be possible to do that, to have you as the instructor or TA do that type of lab as as they watch or, or show a video of it, you know, to actually do it for them and then have them reflect on it and talk about what went right, what went wrong, or things like that? Would it be possible to to have that done by you or a TA, TA with and, and either videotape it and show it to the students. I don't know. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good suggestion. And it's one of the things that we talked about, um, whether or not we individually feel safe to or whether we will get clearance from uh, our administration to go into the labs and create new resources uh, is pretty debatable. It sounds like there's not a lot of, of enthusiasm for that, 99% uh, you know, for safety reasons. They're just wanting to everybody have everybody re be responsible to follow the safer at home guidelines, and certainly not set an example of exception for a bunch of health professional students. And you know, I mean, it's an important message for everybody, but but to send that message that oh well we'll we'll do something special or exceptional um, for a bunch of health or budding health professional students, it just you know, it does, doesn't uh, jive with what seems appropriate. So yeah, we have definitely talked about that as a possibility. That's something we don't possess. 
We have created a lot of videos to teach students or demonstrate to students how to do dissections, but not then kind of run-throughs of the final product for them that we think could be potentially helpful you know, if we can pull it off. But that's still to be determined. Now, if I can understand that. In isolation, I was thinking by yourself, <laughs> doing a dissection. Right. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. we thought the same thing, but even so, that we're, you know, getting appropriate concern about that idea. Hmm. Interesting. So that's all those mm -hmm. different issues. So how do you run into, or any, anyone here run into issues The students, have they started to uh, say anything that they're concerned about the... Oh, I, I was reading some of this online that some of the students are concerned about what the kind of education they're receiving and how are we handling that for our, our students. Uh, are we getting students saying things like that, that they don't feel they're getting the education that they signed up for? Well, they didn't sign up for this. I right? know. <laughs> <They> <laughs> and I know. I'm, not, I'm not getting a lot of the resources that I signed up for right now. Um, so it's a it's an interesting thing, but it it also goes back to sort of the thought that we mentioned early on in the in the lab. Um, what are we learning from this, and how will we apply what we're learning for next semester? All right, we're going to stop the recording and open it up for any personal questions. And so I'm going to stop the recording.